taking this. I've turned it up. I'll be at the pulpit. Earlier when I was preaching at uh, Salem, Westphalia, there was a one-year-old and one-day kid who just wouldn't stop crying the whole, the whole church service. Uh, and it actually made a lot of sense for where my sermon went, so I didn't, I didn't really dislike it. So baby crying, you're okay with me today. Our third, fourth, and fifth graders are in St. Louis. They're worshiping uh, with Mike and Erica Roth right now. Uh, our youth um, did some amazing work this week. Uh, at our, whatever we call that, booth or treat, um, our trunk or treat that got moved indoors. They did uh, um, one story from the Bible downstairs. They did Jesus Calms the Storm. Um, and when you walked in, it was blue walls and a blue floor with one of Dale Green's boats in the middle of the room. Uh, and it started out uh, pretty calm, and then all of a sudden a pretty serious thunderstorm took place. Uh, to the point where Josh uh, Warnock started giving a warning before people walked in like he was already working at Disney World. Uh, it was pretty great. I was proud of our church uh, on Wednesday. I'm proud of it often, but we had hundreds of kids come through and get some candy, and we have candy left. So uh, our Easter eggs might be filled with uh, candy that has Halloween insignias on it. Those are just two markers of a church calendar, of a year of activities where we try to um, fellowship with one another. We try to create safe spaces for young people. We try to instill lessons. We try to celebrate the holidays that are ours. We try to reclaim the holidays that are not. And so this day is another one in the church calendar that is there to teach us something and mark time and remind us of something when we hear so many names of people who have passed that are loved by people in this room. We understand that that is a part of what we are doing as a church family, remembering and missing those who pass and hopefully creating opportunities for those who will come. Uh, this sermon is in large part uh, trying, to, trying to make that case. I think it's a less heavy sermon than my last few have been. I promise not to cry today. But will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask you to be here in this sermon time. Speak the words that need to be spoken to us. Let us clearly hear from you, Lord. If that can be through my voice or any other voices in the room, Lord, then let it be and let it bless us. But if it needs to be just what you whisper to us, what you say and stir in us in this time, and we pray for that in particular and foremost. Open our ears and open our hearts to receive a word from you. And let everything else, Lord, just fall away. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. We're going to be in Psalm 78, the first seven verses of it. If you'd like to turn there, uh, you can. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen. It is a, a psalm of instruction the writer is trying to tell his people something and trying to get them to focus their eyes on something. And the rest of the psalm isn't quite as hopeful as its beginning. Our be the beginning is all we're going to focus on this morning. Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. This sermon will be less a deep dive into scripture than we have done in recent weeks and more a reminder for us on this All Saints Day. Having shared with you last week the life change that is headed my way, I can now be honest with you all 
that I'm seeing the world and my life and indeed scripture differently than ever before. I used to see my role here within church and on the earth as one of interpreter from generation to generation. As of right now, 70 years old and 10 years old is the same distance from my age. And I feel I can understand kids and adults in either direction about equally and talk to them with equal joy and help them understand one another. Some of this is on account of the generation I'm told I represent. They're calling us the Xennials. That's the term they've coined for the micro generation at the tail end of Generation X before the beginning of millennials. Exennials were born between 1977 and 1983. Raise your hand if you are with me. I thought so. God bless you. <laughs> there was one at Salem. 1977 and 1983 are notable years and notable years to my generation because those are the same years that the original Star Wars trilogy were released. <laughs> we borrow some of our attributes from both generations that we straddle. We possess the cynicism of Gen X, the optimism of millennials and their drive. We had an analog childhood and a digital adulthood we were the first generation to have cell phones and laptops, but we didn't have them until we were grown-ups. That makes a big difference. I was 25 when I got my first cell phone. My nephew is nine, and I'm sure we'll have one soon. I want to walk you through what this means. I grew up in the 80s listening to pop and country music from the 60s and 70s, depending upon which car I rode in, my mother's or my father's. When I was a teenager in the 90s, I was listening to grunge bands and rock in the beginning years of hip hop. As an adult, I helped usher in the rebirth of the singer-songwriter, Americana and New Folk. The only music I tend not to like now is modern versions of pop and country and grunge and rock and hip hop, basically anything new. <laughs> I'm told that's how it goes with age. I grew up in the sitcom age when you had to have great writing, great acting, and yes, a great theme song. We had three channels on a clear night. I eventually began to favor a longer form of action shows where things blew up and people were shot at, but nobody died. I think I could preach a whole sermon on just that sentence. I grew up in a time where on television nobody died. Not the sermon I'm preaching today, but something that strikes me as I say it now twice. I was a kid for all the best movies. I'll argue with you about that. I was a teenager for the blossoming of independent films. I was a young adult for the golden age of movies and television. And I was an early adopter of the streaming services. It's how I watch all my TV now. Church was the same way for me. I grew up going to it every Sunday. I went to Sunday school and to worship at my Grandma Rose's church, First Baptist in Brazil, Indiana, as a little kid. Then the Greencastle Christian Church as an older kid. That's where I claimed Jesus as my Savior and got baptized. When I was 12, about to be 13. We moved from Greencastle and we never really found the right fit for us, the right church for us, even though we were in church every Sunday until we found our way here to Linton and to Sarah and the United Church of Christ. This, has pla this place has been the model for what church looks like for me for 25 years now. And our past here at Sarah Church, our previous accomplishments, our previous victories and struggles we've overcome, the previous pastors who have served here to acclaim or otherwise, the saints that have come before my arrival as a student and my return as your pastor are very important to me. This is why we framed our beginning here 
the way we did, as a way to talk about returning to our past with a focus on the future. It's why I made sure a DeLorean showed up and talked nonstop about Back to the Future for most of last summer. I happen to know that one text sent from the back row to the back row said, did Jesus drive a DeLorean? That's how you know you talked about something too much. The past is important here, and I love that we honor it in so many ways. When I look out the door of my office, I can see 16 classes of confirmation pictures. I will always hold the past in a place of high esteem. But something's changing. You better believe the future is taking on greater and greater significance because it is there where all of my son or daughter's life will take place. Some of you prepared me for that. But it's hitting me in waves. And so as we honor those who have passed this last year in worship and we read a passage of scripture about passing along from one generation to the next, the stories of how God has taken care of us and the promise of a life in him, please understand that in a way, in a way that I have not been committed to before now, I will be doing everything in my power to make every tomorrow I can influence better than today. Isn't that what all parents want? to hand their children a better world to live in with better opportunities, with more resources to bear and a greater capacity to accomplish them. I do not understand anyone who isn't concerned with what happens here after they are gone. Especially anyone who has a kid or a grandkid or a great grandkid or the hope to have any especially anyone who has a friend or a neighbor or a church acquaintance who they know will survive them. Because let me prepare you for a day that I hope is far, far away for all of us. One day, they're going to read your name in church and ring a bell to honor that you had been here. Me too. Right here. One day they'll say my name aloud and ring that bell and my kid or my kid, kids, my kids and grandkids or God willing six generations of roses will be here for it, but I no longer will be. And where I might be gifted in interpreting from generation to generation, my purpose is to share the love of Jesus Christ with all the generations my life touches. Let me say that again. My purpose is to share the love of Jesus Christ with all the generations my life touches. Yours is too. Okay, I'm doing it again. Getting heavy again. I meant not to. And there you are now contemplating your own mortality if you are listening at all. Let me tell you a story. I'll try to warm this up. It comes from one of my favorite books, Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. I read that book every year. The story goes this way. The story is about a little wave bobbing along in the ocean, having a grand old time. He's enjoying the wind and the fresh air, the bouncing up and down until he notices the other waves far ahead of him crashing against the shore and then the waves closer to him crashing against the shore and he thinks, my God, this is terrible. Look what's going to happen to me. And then along comes another wave and it sees the first wave looking grim and says to him, why do you look so sad? And the first wave says, you don't understand. We're all going to crash. All of us waves are going to be nothing. Isn't it terrible? And the second wave says, oh, no, you don't understand. You're not a wave. You're part of the ocean.
My friends, this passage of scripture is an attempt to convince the people of Israel how important it is to share the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done with the generations that come after them. It is for us the same. We are to teach our children that the next generation might know God, that the children yet unborn might rise up and tell the stories of God to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. We can't help but crash into the shore, but we are a part of the ocean. And given the task to tell all the waves that come behind us the good news, given the task to tell all those who come behind us about God and his mighty works. And we have an even greater responsibility to do this work than the Israelites did because we can share what they, in fact, only hoped for, the good news of Jesus Christ. We can invite people to know, grow, and show the love of Jesus Christ in their lives that we know in ours. What an amazing gift we've been given. What an amazing purpose we are called to. Oh, wow. Okay, Jeff and I installed what we're calling the tag team button. And we decided that anytime the Holy Spirit was moving one of us, we would hit that button and initiate a switch in the middle of the sermon. This is the sound cue for that very thing. So this is the first time we've done it. But anytime we hear that sound from, from now on, you know that the next preacher is up. So Jeff, for the first time, I'm going to tag you in. Take it away. Kind of good music, wasn't it? Makes you want to move. I can't hardly top that deep sermon. It was moving. It was generational. And I loved one of the things that J.D. said is, is the story about the ocean and the wave. That's powerful. And as always, I want you to think of yourself where you're at today. Are you a wave? Or are you part of the ocean? I'm, you may see me yawn. I, I drove out to uh, Missouri yesterday and eight hour drive. I went a little further than Shannondale. I, was, I had the privilege of going to see my, my son, who's the pastor at Shannondale United Church of Christ, do his, well, he's done a few weddings, but I've got to see two. And I have to tell you, the first one I saw was a few weeks ago at my niece's, and it was the best wedding I've ever attended. And then yesterday, I would have to say it ties with the best wedding I've ever attended. This young man, he's amazing. Amazing, and he loves God so much. And I was, had the privilege of sitting in with a congregation with my other son who loves God so much. Let me tell you, they were wild waves at one time. Wild waves. And as I was, I saw that uh, the title of J.D.'s sermon was Generation to Generation. And... It got me thinking. We honored those who have who've passed on, those, those part of many generations who we have learned from and saw, and we watched them breathe. We watched them in action. And then we rem rem remembered them today. But it's got me thinking that that what What's going on today at Saren and at Salem and, and in the body of Christ? And I got to thinking of Jess and that, that, that son or daughter who is being formed. And what he or she will see from, from this congregation. 
And most of all, one of my joys is to see how JD will change over the next few <laughs> years. As his little wave starts to head toward the shore. But that's part of life. That's part of being part of the body of Christ. When you're driving an eight hour trip by yourself, you have a lot of time to think. Put them together, 16 hours of thinking. What's the future hold? What did I do in my past? What about today? It got me remembering, and that's, that's one good thing why I, I love that buzzer. I can hit that buzzer and you hear some pretty music and whoop, new pastor. Yesterday as I was sitting there watching this young man who was a wild wave at one time, being part of bringing two people together to, to share a life together, to raise a family, to, to create and to be part of their life for that moment and then to remain part of their married life. It rem I remembered the time when I was back here doing youth ministry with my wife and wonderful volunteers from Saren and this kid, this high school kid, walked up named Rose. I thought, wow, that's a wave just waiting to hit the shore. But I, there was something different about this, this wild wave. He was, I got to know him really not here because it was about the time we, we took the calling to go out to Shannondale. But I got to see this young man in action with other young people, with adults, with locals. He had an ear. He could listen. And being surprisingly young, he, he had some pretty good advice. That stuck with me. Never knowing that in 24 years I would be tag teaming with this wonderful young man. Never knowing that I'd be sitting in an in a old barn in the middle of the Ozarks watching my prematurely born youngest son who weighed four pounds, six ounces, who was allergic to creation, <laughs> who climbed in bed with his mom and dad every morning after he had soaked his bed. I don't know how they can sneak in there without waking you up, but they can. How this little guy this little wild wave could be helping bring two people together with unconditional love. Then I got to think in generations, everything he saw, heard, felt, touched, he saw that ocean, he saw that body of Christ. And it made me think even more. This, this little one that, that J.D. And, and his lovely wife will have soon, when, when Jess gives birth to this new creation, this, I'm sorry, to this wonderful creation, boy or girl, it starts the taking in the, the witnessing, the seeing every action of the body of Christ. Even though we're different generations. I kind of got a kick out of that too. I jotted down the theme songs that was playing when I was growing up. It's a story of a lovely lady <laughs> who was bringing up three very lovely... Who's in that generation? Just sit down and I'll tell a tale, a tale of a faithful trip. Yep, yep, see some hands. Even though there's different theme songs, 
And now when I would watch a, a good show at night, this is really aging me, most of the time the mom and dad didn't sleep in the same bed. Do you remember that? I think the very first time I watched the Waltons and, 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 and mom and dad slept in the same bed and I went, oh my gosh, we, may, we shouldn't watch this. That's how time changes the different things we take in I didn't get a cell phone till I was like 35. And it was a big one. <laughs> I remember my boys got a cell phone at 16 because they got their license and we wanted to track those waves. <laughs> I see six year olds with cell phones. Times they're changing. But the ocean remains full with many waves. The body of Christ remains full with many parts. As this young life develops in the Rose family, he or she will be a wave, but there is a big ocean that he or she is in, the body of Christ. Even though our theme songs may be different, we all have the same thing in common, to share the love of Jesus Christ, to show the love of Jesus Christ, to teach the love of Jesus Christ. In other words, we are all called to be Christ-like, which is totally impossible. Amen? But we are to strive to our best abilities to be Christ-like. It's an honor to be part of this ocean, this body. Continue to teach and mold and shape and most of all love amen amen thanks for allowing me to tap in on that One of the happy accidents that has happened in the last couple months is we found out that there's a new person among us with some real talent. And God put a song on his heart to sing to us this morning. We decided it was the perfect way to close out our worship service, or at least this portion of our sermon anyway. So we welcome our new member, Jerry, to uh, share some music with us.
That is just the first of a few blessings that we have uh, lined up uh, today. <clears throat> Some of them are close, and I'm giddy with excitement. I want to share the prayer concerns that were shared with us this morning. We want to pray for uh, Helen Jean Ringhofer. I hope I said that close to right. That's Ruthie Strong's cousin in Minneapolis. She is age 88 and can use our prayers. Uh, we want to pray for the third, fourth, and fifth graders to get home safely from St. Louis uh, this afternoon. Um, they checked in with me this morning. They said they were having a great time. Uh, we want to pray for John and Carol Stell. I hope I said that right. Uh, uh, these are the parents of Lori Cook, who's a visitor with us today. Uh, just prayers for their health. John and Carol Stell. I hope I said that close to right. Uh, we want to pray for Jean uh, Nabel. That's the, uh, the sister of Susan uh, Nabel, who's here. Uh, cancer in her sinus passages is uh, what she's been recently diagnosed with. We want to also pray for the Roth family, um, uh, having still, uh, still being uh, in mourning for Mike's father, uh, Erica's sister passed away this week as well. Uh, so prayers for them. Um, last week, uh, my sermon was a bunch of moments that if you looked at in my life, you'd go, wow, what a mess. <laughs> and then this one moment that, in my opinion, redeems them all. So this next prayer request is another one of those. Okay, I'm not going to cry today. I promised myself I wasn't going to cry today. These would be happy tears, but it's still like got to get out of that habit. <clears throat> for a long time, for a really, really long time, for as long as I've known her, Lynn Shunk's been praying to be a mom. And for a long time in their marriage, Tim and Lynn have been trying to be a mom and a dad. And this week, this week it became official, Derek and Colson are their baby boys and they're theirs for now on. <laughs> I got to be real close when they shared their heart and, uh, uh, in the adoption interview, and I was just so proud of them. I, I remain so proud of them. And I'm so excited I get to raise kids just after you're raising some, because I'm going to need a lot of help. <laughs> uh, but Derek and Colson are with them now and with them for good, and we couldn't be happier. Uh, that's how it works, right? We have people that we miss and we love and we ring a bell for and we know have gone to a better place, and we have some folks who are hurting uh, and we also have some folks who are uh, delighted. That is the life uh, of this church family. The line that jumped out at me today, Jerry, of that song is, having loved, uh, I will dare to love. Man, what a powerful, powerful thing as we talk about sharing the love of Jesus from generation to generation. Will you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for every blessing this morning that we have already experienced and all the blessings that are yet to come. We thank you for those who sing your praises and for those who will. We thank you for those who call upon your name in their darkest hour and we ask you to be with them now. But we also thank you for those whose darkest hour seems far away now, even though it was recent for the blessings they have received that have changed everything going forward. We want to pray for the folks who are uh, dealing with sickness and illness, a few whose names we shared before. We pray for Helen and we pray for John and Carol. We pray for Jean. We pray for safety for the third, fourth, and fifth graders. We pray uh, for the Roth family as they continue to grieve. Not one, but now two losses. Comfort them in their time of grieving. But God, we are so thankful for the blessings you have now put in Tim and Lynn's life for the uh, uh, immediate turnover from just respite to mom and dad that they will have to endure. And we are so excited to watch that happen. So excited that you've made it happen. We celebrate with our friends on this day that we still remember those we have lost. You've given it to us again, Lord. Joys and concerns, loss and blessing side by side, simultaneous as always. Help us to take you with us as we depart here, Lord, and share you with the generations we encounter to tell your stories to all those you put in front of us, to share the love of Jesus Christ with those you place in our path. 
Father, we gather here and we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.